They don't like the idea that mind can be reduced to matter. They're not playing that game. They're not playing that the, the game that the subject is only epiphenomenal and the object is real. They're not playing that game either. And it's partly because, as Boss says, without a subject, nothing at all would exist to confront objects and to imagine them as such. True, this implies that every object, everything objective, is merely objective, in being merely objectivized by the subject, is the most subjective thing possible. It's a radical claim, you know. But here's, here's something to think about. When I look at that Coke can, you might say, oh, I perceive the object, and then I make inferences about its use, and then I evaluate it, and then I use it. And, you know, that is not actually what you do. In fact, it's not obvious at all that what you perceive are objects. And, and if you think about it, well, people weren't perceiving scientific objects until like 1500 AD or 1450. So, there was no objective object before then. So, obviously, whatever we were perceiving was not precisely that, because we would have been scientists right off the bat. George Kelly claimed that people were natural scientists, you know, that we were always investigating hypotheses and trying to disprove them and so on. And it's an interesting theory, and in it's right in a sense, but fundamentally it's wrong. We are not natural scientists, we're natural engineers. And when we look at the world, we don't see objects and then in further use. What we actually see is the use. So, for example, when I look at that Coke can, my, my visual system activates my motor cortex directly. It can do that without me seeing the damn can consciously to some degree, because there are people with blind sight. I've told you about those people. They say they can't see, but if you ask them which hand you have held up, they can tell you. So, they might not be able to see but they can map patterns from their visual system onto their motor output. You know, and that's basically what Piaget said we do when we deal with the world. We're embodied creatures, you know. And so what we see when we look around aren't objects. They're things we can use and things that get in our way. You know, and that's a theory that was derived originally from J.J. Gibson, who wrote a great book on that called The Visual Approach to Ecological, Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. And his Science is a brand of pragmatism, and the pragmatists basically claim that, you know, things, including theories and perceptions, have a limited range of truth, and the truth that, that the, the limited range of truth is determined by the match between your actions and the outcome. So I think this is a Coke can. Is that what it is? No, but it's good enough for me if I want to drink a bit of Coke out of it. God only knows what it is, you know. If you go into communist China, and you start advertising these things, then what are they? Because this thing tells a story, right? What's the story? Like, really, do you need Coca-Cola? No. It's like, it's a bit of frippery, you know? It's a bit of, it's an unnecessary luxury. It's not even very good for you. But it's kind of fuzzy, and it's sweet, and you get to buy it. And why is that? Because no matter how stupid you are in your nutrition choices, as far as our society goes, you have the right to poison yourself in whatever way you think best befits you. And so when you send this little Coke can off to communist China, this thing screams stupid individuality all over. And God only knows how it undermines the state. You know, and if, you don't, if you're not thinking about that, you're not thinking. Think about what happens when we export cars. What does a car say? It says, hey, you can go wherever you want, whenever you want, you don't have to tell anybody at all. And you can do it in a really dangerous, high-speed manner. It's like, you want a political statement? Wrap it up in metal and ship that thing off. And everybody goes, whoa, I'd really like to have one of those. It's like, poof, communism disappears with that. You know, the, there's nothing that says individuality and capitalism like a personal automobile. You know, you even get to pollute the atmosphere and ruin the planet with the damn thing. But, you know, if you have to drive to the corner store and pick up your damn Coke, it's like to hell with the atmosphere. <laughs> so don't be thinking that the things that appear in front of you are merely objects, because they're not. You know, I started thinking about this, for example, when I was thinking about people going down to Graceland to look at Elvis's guitar. You think, what exactly is it that makes a guitar Elvis's guitar? You know, it's not exactly the guitar. 
Because it's just sitting there like any old guitar, you know, and maybe you could even think about it You could take that guitar out, and you could put another guitar in that looked just like it And it would still be Elvis's guitar, because no one would know And you might think, well then that's not really Elvis's guitar But that's a funny thing, because you would only think that if you thought that Elvis's guitar was the thing that was made out of material that was sitting right in front of you And that isn't what it is That's only one tiny little bit of it That bloody thing is, is a part of an incredibly layered reality, right? I mean, the people who want to go look at that They're looking at it in some sense because of the magic that's emanating from it But the magic is actually real You know, the magic is the effect of that guitar, let's say, on the entire culture And those effects are the damn guitar too And it's weird because when you go look at Elvis's guitar You're not looking at the guitar You're looking at the magic And weirdly enough, the magic is actually real Well, you can't think that way if you're a materialist Because you think that the thing is the material It's like, yeah, right I can tell you another story So, when the, when the Europeans came to the South Pacific Islands the South Pacific Islanders, because there weren't that many of them They didn't have a very high, highly technical society, you know And so like if you were like Joe Dominant guy in a Pacific Island culture You know, you might be able to have a stone axe Like a well-made stone axe Because you go out and make a stone axe and see how long that takes you It's like, that's a bit of work And so if you're a high status guy If you've really worked your whole life to be at the top of your damn pyramid You get, maybe you get had two axes, you know It's like a red letter day You've got two axes, you know, which is more than any other animal has, by a lot So it's not trivial And then the damn missionaries come in, eh? And they set up shop, and what do they bring? Steel axes It's like, that's kind of a downer, you know You've worked your whole damn life to get these stone axes And that makes you like head tribesmen And then you want, your kid wanders down to the local missionaries And they say, oh, we got an extra steel axe Here, why don't you take that back home? And it's like, it's so shocking, because not only do the missionaries have this thing that is so much better than a steel axe It's like a jet plane compared to a, to a wheeled cart Like, they're really, really different But the missionaries, they don't even notice That's the horrible thing about it It's like they give away this thing that has a virtually infinite value And it's like, well, it's okay, we got you know, a couple dozen of those sitting in the storeroom And, you know, we're just willing to hand them out It was a little demoralizing it was a little demoralizing for the Pacific Islanders And so, you know, what, was it an axe that the missionaries gave away? It wasn't You'd think that if you were a Westerner and you had a bunch of axes It's like, yeah, that's an axe It's like, yeah, right It's a lot more than an axe A lot more It's a weapon to bring down a whole culture accidentally 